All right, so somebody recently asked me to do a video on racism. I, I think that you guys are just kind of purposely trying to get me in trouble. So somebody asked me to do a video on the FBI spying. Somebody asked me to do a video on Donald Trump's views on immigration. Now this, I really think that you guys just enjoy watching me get my ass kicked and handed to me by trolls who have never watched the content, who just want to like pry through every word I say and like just, just, just find reasons to just destroy it. But whatever. And yeah, this may be fun. So racism and why I think it's bullshit. Let's start with a story from about 22 years ago. And if you're one of those people who does, don't like these long-winded videos where I seem to talk a lot and tell a story, just hit X. It, trust me, just hit X because this is going to be a long one. So 22 years ago, I'm walking along the street with my grandma. So every summer, I would spend about one or two weeks with my grandma. I love spending time with my grandma because I don't know how it is in your household, but I, I came from one of those families where... The parents may treat their kids like, like, like uh, you know, just a, a, like really strict and, you know, very, very, very strict on how they do everything. But then they'll treat the, that same parent will treat their grandchildren like they can do no wrong. There's nothing you can do wrong if, you, if you're the grandkid. I could throw ice cream at the walls. I could probably, you know, jump up and down and blast music at two in the morning. And it's just, oh, look at how cute are my grandkids. My grandma had a really thick Italian accent. So... It, you know, it was fun for a five or a six-year-old. And I remember walking down the street with her one day, and there she waves hello to one of her friends, and then she asks if I want to play with her grandkids. And I look on the, on the porch, and I see them playing, and it's not actually playing. It's four kids, and one of them is much smaller than the other three, and they're all laughing and laughing, but the three of them are laughing at how they're beating the crap out of the other one every time the grandma turns around. And it wasn't playful. It was intimidating. It was scary. It was that, that, that kid was clearly uncomfortable. He clearly wanted to leave, but he knew if he tried to leave, he wouldn't get away. And it was one of those things where he was like just at the brink of tears. And they were all older than me. So I was about five or six at the time. These kids were like 10 or 13. I knew what was going on. I'm like, no way in hell. He goes, oh, why don't you want to play? Look, they're all having fun. And I'm like, no way in hell. I don't, I go, well, why would I want to be a part of intimidation and bullying and people beating the crap out of one another? I mean, that's, I, and I, especially when I'm smaller than the 10 year old that they're probably all be, that all the 11, 12, and 13 year olds are beating the shit out of. No, thank you. And we continue walking. Then we, we walk past the park, and I'm looking at the park, and there's a bunch of kids playing basketball. They, they were, these were kids were a little older. I would say they were somewhere between the age of 15 and 20. They're all playing basketball, and I'm looking, and they're going, yeah, yeah, and they're patting each other on the back. They're going back and forth. They're speaking competitively, so you can tell that they're saying some competitive stuff back and forth, like, yeah, I got you, or, oh, you know, uh, you, know you got your ass handed to you there, and just whatever. I, I don't remember the exact words at the time, but it was, it was, it was shit like that, that you'd say if you know, you're playing a video game back and forth and you just kick somebody's ass, or you're playing football and somebody just fell down. You know, it was friendly, but it was competitive. And, the, and she looks at me, she's like, no, no. And she grabs my arm, and I'm, and I'm looking, and she like turns my head around. She goes, no, we are not going in there. You, you do not go in that park. And I'm like, why not? She goes, and she actually starts to cross the street when they start to look at me because I was looking at them playing and smiling, and I waved. And then they're looking at her because she's so scared. And she starts crossing the street. You know what the difference was here? Is that the kids playing basketball in the park were black. And the kids that were beating the shit out of one another that my grandma wanted me to play with because they looked so nice were young white Italians. You see, the problem with racism is this. I, and I don't try to look at things in terms of all the problems. What I try to do, I try to approach life the same way that I approach electronics problems. You know, I don't, if I see that there's a problem in the front of the circuit, then I, before I check every single little thing, I will check the back of the circuit. So if I don't have sound, I'm not going to check every little thing in between. I'm going to check at the front. Do I have a power supply that works before I check everything else? And the problem I see with racism is this. The front problem, the primary issue with racism is that it stops people from thinking. I'm not going to say that race is the, I'm not going to get into every issue of race. I'm not going to get into the violence. I'm not going to get into these people can get jobs and these people can't. I'm not going to get into you're allowed into this club and you're not allowed into this club. I'm not going to get into the stereotypes and any of the other crap because all of that stems from the fact that when people act in a racist manner, that they stop 
thinking. When my grandma saw people that looked like her, that she identified with, she looked and she stopped thinking. She was not thinking about whether what the, whether the, the look on that very, very scared kid who was about to cry's face might just be because he's getting the shit kicked out of him. She's not going to look at the fact that he's knocked down. She's not going to look at the fact that the other kids, every single time she's looking away and talking to the mom, are saying, re- grandma is saying really, really mean things that are very obviously related to the fact that they just kicked the shit out of him. She's not going to try to notice the fear. She's not going to pick up on that. She's turned her brain off in that instance. And the same thing is true when we pass the park where the kids are playing basketball. She's not thinking about the fact that they're all smiling at one another. She's not looking to see that there's no violent behavior. She's not looking to see that it's a friendly game. She saw people different from her that appear to be doing something that is uh, competitive. And she interpreted, instead of thinking, she interpreted that competitiveness as a threat. Because admittedly, when you're competing, there is a bit of that whole, you know, there's a bit of that energy, that vibe of we're trying to beat you, we're trying to win over you. And she took that kind of personally, apparently, and tried to walk me across the street because she wasn't thinking. The problem with racism is that people turn off their brains when they choose to be racist. This is the the biggest issue that I've ever seen with racism. And it, it you know, it's something that a lot of us are guilty of at some point in our lives or another. Anybody who's ever laughed at a racist joke is guilty of. I'm not going to say that I've never been guilty of not turning. I'm like, I can't say I'm not guilty of having turned off my brain at points in my life. And I can't say that I haven't made a silly snicker at a racist joke, whether it's about my race or somebody else's at some point in life. And most people watching this video that are honest with themselves probably you're going to say the same thing I am. Again, you probably didn't go through 20 or 40 or 60 years of life and never hear a, you know, never hear a racist joke and, and, and laugh or snicker at one point. And, there, and, and, and I admit it. I admit that at that point that I was doing that, that I was being stupid and that I was turning off my brain. You know, when people will look and say, like, let's say, come up with some, some, some stereotype, like, you know, all of these people are, are bums, right? And they don't know how to conduct themselves professionally. Okay, well, let's, let's just take, some, let's just take some, some random stereotype. Let's just say like, you know, black people don't have jobs, some stupid shit like that. So let's say you take one of those stereotypes. Now, what a racist person is going to do is if they go by a certain neighborhood, black neighborhood, they may be on a train car with 50 people. Now, they may see 47 of those people with briefcases, 47 of those people wearing a tie, 47 of those people reading a book or something that has to do with work or a newspaper and a, that has to do with their industry. They're reading an article on their industry. 47 professionally dressed, professional appearing people that seem like they have a reason to get up and go to work every day. And then they're going to look and see three people that are acting like bums, that are being idiots, that are yelling loudly and profusely, that are dressed as if they don't have a job, that don't seem to give a crap about much of anything. And you know what the racist is going to do? The racist is going to ignore the 47 people that do not fit the stereotype. The racist is going to look at the three people that do fit the stereotype and say, see, I'm right. And that's where this is really fucking stupid and really fucking dumb. And here's the, here's the thing. Here's the, the other thing with racism. So the first thing with racism is that you're going to turn off your brain. So you're going to ignore all of the information that proves your stereotype wrong, but you're going to allow the information in that proves your stereotype right. So now you're going to think that you're right. And now this is where it gets really bad. You know, this is something that goes on w- w- with my neighborhood. So, you know, the, you'll have racist people say things like, uh, you know, all black people leech off welfare. All black people do this. And what they'll, and admittedly, my neighborhood has, uh, you know, a lot of project housing in it. And my neighborhood was also, pre- at least when I moved in, like I moved here there almost 10 years ago. It was predominantly black. I was, um, so they'll say, look, see that? I'm right. See, look at the neighborhood you live in. I'm right. Look at the project houses and who lives there. And you know what they're going to do? They're going to ignore the fact that in other parts of the country that have 10 times the population that my neighborhood that does, and other parts of the country that have 100 times the population of my neighborhood, that almost every single person in project housing is white. They're going to ignore that fact. They're going to ignore the fact that there's an entire country outside of this one neighborhood, but they're going to use that one neighborhood to prove, look, I'm right. The problem with racism is that people always look to support their theory using whatever's in front of them while ignoring all the other information that's there. Because technically, you're right. If you believe that the world is my specific zip code, yes, there are more black people than white people in project housing. But there's also more black people in general 
the, the that's the neighborhood. Of course, there's going to be more black people in project housing. There's also going to be more black people that graduated magna cum laude and went on to make seven figure salaries than white people in that neighborhood because there's more black people in general. But you're ignoring that because that doesn't support your racist bullshit. And the issue here is that just people just decide to turn off their brain. And here's the real shameful shit when it comes to turning off your brain. Here's the part that really fucking sucks is that you start to project that out into the world, is that you believe yourself. So now you're believing your own bullshit. And by the way, one of the most dangerous things you can do in the world is believe your own bullshit. The most dangerous shit that you can do is believe the crap that comes out of your mouth is correct. You should say the stuff that you say, but then I want you to think about it. And I want you to think really hard about wh whether what you actually said is true before you just believe it because you said it. You're going to say a lot of stuff that's not true. So you believe what you said, Ralph, right? So now you're going to start acting it. So let's say you're walking down the street and you see somebody that looks different than you. And because they look different than you and they act different from you and they speak different from you, well, you don't know how to handle it. So they walk, you, they walk by you or you walk by them and you do this, some, something like this. This is what happens with a lot of the hipsters that moved into my neighborhood, by the way, which I just laugh. It doesn't happen much anymore. Thankfully, people are starting to you know, get their head out of their ass. But in the, like, you know, like about 10 years ago, I, this, this shit happened and I would just laugh. They would walk down the street and do something like this. And, and they would just walk in their own direction after doing that whole you know, funny eyes shit. So if I'm looking at, so let's say I'm looking at you and I don't know who you are. Because I don't know who you are, I'm prob I may not, especially in New York City, I may not greet you with a, hi, how are you, that you would get in a suburb. If I'm meeting you, whether regardless of the race that you are, regardless of the race that I am, in Brooklyn or the Bronx or anything, or the, you know, I'm, not, I'm probably not going to go. I'm not going to come up to you with a little tray of cookies. I'm going to look at you and wait to see how you respond to me, particularly if this is my homeland. It's the place that I've lived for 50 years that you just came into. So it's on the person who's just coming there to set the tone for the conversation. So if you do something like this, if they look at you and you go, and you pretend they don't exist and keep walking, well, what the fuck do you expect you're going to get out of them? You're probably not going to get a nice response out of them. So those new people that move into the neighborhood that are like, oh, yeah, the people who live here are bums or blah, blah, blah. They're the people that are walking down the street. Again, it's on you as the new person to the neighborhood to set the tone for how you're treated. And when you walk down the street and somebody looks at you and you do this bullshit, that, that googly-eyed bullshit, and then you look away, what tone do you think you're setting? What, how do you think that person's going to treat you? You know, this, this, I, I liken this to relationships where, you know, you'll have people that are actually going out with somebody who is very, very monogamous, who's very, very dedicated, but the boyfriend always thinks that she's cheating. She, he has no trust for her. He doesn't let her go out with her friends. He doesn't let her talk to people. He's always in her business. And then one day, because she doesn't feel trust, because she doesn't feel loved, because she doesn't feel trusted, she decides to break up with him and go out with another dude. And he'll say, fucking cheating Bitch, she was cheating all along. Reality, she wasn't cheating all along. She loved you and cared about you, but because of your behavior, because of what you projected onto her, she now cheated on you and left you. And the same thing is true here. You know, you kind of put something out into the world, and then if you get that back... Don't say that it's their fault when you're the one who put it out in the world. Don't say these people don't like me or these people are bums or whatever when you're the one who put out that racist, you know, eye, googly eyed bullshit into the world. I am five foot six. I dress funny. I had some dress shoes on and some shitty, cheap ass docker pants because I'm always, um, I'm always uh, sometimes I have meetings that I have to go to, but I also do a lot of soldering in my office. And I don't feel like dropping lead that's at 900 degrees Fahrenheit onto $60 pants. So I look kind of funny when I was coming home that day and I was carrying my ThinkPad and the stupid little funny briefcase. I did not look like the average person who walked down my block. I, was, I looked cheap. Like kind of like a like attempting to look professional while looking cheap while being white and short. This was not the stereotype of somebody who lived on my block circa 2008, 2009. And I'm walking home and there's a bunch of people talking on the stoop and none of the people talking on the stoop look like me and none of them act like me and none of them speak like me. And they all looked at me for a second. And I looked back at them and I said, hey, how's it going? And I put my hand out to, you know, I actually had, I was holding something at the time. So I just wanted to do, you know, like a, bump, but not like a handshake, because I was, I think I had like, I was holding my Lenovo, I was holding some stuff, and I had a drink. So I did this. And you know what they did? You know what they did? They looked back at me and they said, how are you? And every single day for the last seven or eight fucking years, when I come down out of my apartment, they go, how are you? How's it going? 
it doesn't matter that, that again, that, that I don't relate to a lot of the culture. It doesn't matter that I wasn't somebody they grew up with. It doesn't matter that I'm frankly, a, you know, I, I look pretty fucking weird most of the time. It doesn't, none of that shit matters. What matters is that I set the tone for the conversation just by not being an asshole, just by putting that positive energy out there into the world. Again, maybe it just has something to do with how I was raised and the fact that when I was, ra- you know, I, I was made fun of as a kid and I just learned at a really early age to not give a fuck what other people think of me, to not care about what other people think when they look at me, to not care if somebody else is different and decides to look at me and say, I don't like you because you're different or to laugh at me. Maybe it's because I, I gained an immunity to that when I was five and six years old. But I think it's served me well throughout life because I can go into rooms with people with totally different to me, totally different cultures, totally different backgrounds, totally different religions, totally different ways of dressing, totally different professions, different belief systems. And it's just, again, it's that same thing. I don't get weirded out. I don't start looking around. I don't start making assumptions of all the people and how they're different than me and how they're worse than me. All I do is I say, hey, how are you? I just, and I just have, I try to have a humble, honest smile on my face while I'm saying it. And the whole, same humble smile I would have just to be happy to be meeting somebody new and being in a new situation. And you have no idea how far that goes. It goes so far towards eliminating so much of this bullshit that I see going on when people just start, start becoming racist and start, and start saying just stupid shit for no reason, start thinking stupid shit for no reason. Do you have any idea how much of the racist, stupid shit that you think starts with you, starts with your attitude, starts with how you treat people. Do you have any idea when you say everybody of this race is this way, do you have any idea how much of that comes from the fact that you're pigeonholing, you're ignoring everybody else who doesn't fit your stereotype and focusing specifically on this uh, this tiny little niche section of people. You know, one joke that some people on the block that I grew up on used to have is actually related to Italians. So a lot of the people on my block were the people who were were the, um, the sons and daughters of the people who immigrated here from Italy in the 1950s and the 1940s. And a big stereotype amongst that group was, you know, the whole, you can't program a VCR, they don't know how to use electronics. You see it in The Sopranos, you know, in the first season when they're trying to use the DVD player and like, fucking piece of shit, I'm going to make this thing work. And they start bashing it with the remote. They take the gun or whatever and they start bashing the DVD player. I'm going to make the fucking piece of shit work. You know that stereotype. And it's a stereotype. And, you know, I, I, and people would make fun about electronics and shit like that and how, you know, my mother kind of fit the stereotype a little bit. But, you know, they would ignore me. They would, anytime you hear those type of jokes being made, they would totally ignore me. Of course, you're go- of course you're going to ignore the nine-year-old that's modding PlayStations to play copied games. Of course you're going to ignore the 16-year-old kid that built his first Seamoy headphone amplifier inside of an Altoid scan. Because I don't fit your stereotype. Because I don't fit your ignorant, closed-minded little bullshit. And, you know... I want you to think about, are you actually doing that when you're being racist? Are you, are you ignoring all of the people that don't fit your closed-minded, ignorant little idea of how the world works uh, just so that you can reinforce the, you know, what some joke you heard on the fucking internet 10 years ago tells you a certain group of people are? And that's something that I really see, I would suggest you think about. Now, the follow-up portion to that question over here has to do with violence. Now, another thing the person who asked me to do this video, get, uh, he asked me to get into, was also, again, I th- sometimes I just think you guys just want me to get my ass kicked by YouTube and social media, but they wanted me to get into the, you know, the whole uh, violence, cop shootings and thing and the, you know, the race issues with that and the, and the Black Lives Matter movement and all that. And again, I, I don't feel qualified to discuss this. I am not black. I am not a policeman. I am not, I am not any of the parties involved here. So I really have no idea what I, what I can actually uh, contribute to that discussion, but eh, what the hell. So when it comes to police in general, the reason I stay away from this, the reason I stay away from that ar- argument has nothing to do with the fact that I don't, it, it really comes down to, I try to not give my opinions on things unless I feel that I can actually change them. So one of the things I say in a lot of these videos when people ask me, why are you putting so much time and effort into teaching your direct competitors how to do your job? And people will ask me that and I'll say, I want to be a part of the change I want to see in the world. So if I complain because I can't find answers to my problems, how can I complain about that when I was not part of providing answers to those questions? So if I am not putting out answers for you, how can I complain when there's no answers for me? That's the way I I see the world. So if I think that I can repair motherboards better than L2, if I'm sick and tired of the fact that motherboard repair is done the way L2 repair does it and how they treat their customers, I am the type of person who is going to spend 
$30,000 that at the time he does not have on equipment to do that and stay at work until 4 or 6 in the morning to figure out how to do that to the point where I'm better than them. If I don't like the way a company is selling screens, I'm not the type of person who's just going to complain and bitch. I'm the type of person who's going to start Rossman Supply, borrow money to buy almost a million dollars worth of inventory so that I can compete and do the same thing better. That thing didn't work out. But the whole idea is, regardless of whether it works out, I don't. I try not to criticize situations. I try not to criticize people unless I'm actually willing to sit and you know stand in their shoes and do a better job than them. And when it comes to police in general, I'm not willing to do that. I'm not. I don't like. I don't want to get shot. I don't want to get my ass kicked on a regular basis. I don't want to be put in situations where I have to tell people who are breaking the law, who are doing something violent or bad, hey. You stop doing that. Hey, yeah, I know you're much bigger than me, but stop doing that. Hey, yeah, I know you have a semi-automatic weapon, but stop doing that. No, I wouldn't do that for 100000 a year. I wouldn't do that job for half a million a year. And I sure as shit am not doing that job for the $35,000 a year that many law enforcement officials across the country start out at. I'm not going to do that. And because I'm not willing to do that, I'm also, I have to abide by my rule where I'm, I limit my criticism. I'm not going to have no criticism. If that person goes out and just starts stabbing babies in the middle of the street, obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm going to criticize. But for the most part, I try not to criticize a lot of them. I try to not criticize people when I'm not willing to do their job. I try to limit it. And here, that's a job that I'm not willing to do. And what it comes down to, again, in the beginning of this video, I was talking about how I try to look for the, you know, the, I look at what's happening at the end, and then instead of trying to trace my way back, I go all the way to the beginning and when I'm trying to solve a circuit-related problem. If I start with there's a short to ground or this there's no 5 volts where 5 volts is supposed to be, I don't go through the buck converter, through the resistors in the enable circuit. I'm just going to go straight to the chip that sends the enable signal and see if it's there before I fuck with everything else. I like to get to the top of a problem and instead of going through every little thing in between. And what I believe is that this all comes down to a lack of thinking. That was what I th was saying. The biggest problem is when it comes to racism in general. That was a the theme of the first part of the video. And I think the same is true here. It comes down to a lack of thinking. You know, again, you're you know, again, you're, you're, you're sitting there and you're choking somebody and, you know, they may not be listening to you. They're screaming, fuck you, whatever. Let's ignore that for a second because I understand why somebody may say, you know, I, they're not complying and they're, 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 they're screaming at me. But when, you, again, when I am choking somebody, and maybe they're, they're bigger than me, but when I'm around four other people or they know, three or four other cops, even if, if they're saying I can't breathe, I can't breathe, okay, whatever. I get it. Maybe he's faking it. Maybe he has a knife on him that he can, you know, whatever. Maybe, maybe he's faking it. But if he's to the point where he's half dead, maybe. I'm not saying let him go, but maybe instead of choking him to the point where he's just about to die, maybe I'm going to move my hand a little bit out just like that and trust the fact that the three or four trained officers around me will help me if something happens. It's a little bit of thinking. Maybe when I see somebody that's a quarter the height that I am, and I'm an adult, that I'm going to think, wait a second, before I shoot that person, maybe that's a cell phone because a cell phone is going to reflect the street light the same way the gun is. And then maybe if I'm just about to shoot somebody who wants to, who wants to kill me or maybe wants to kill me, I shot him once. Hey, wait a second. Bullet is strong. Bullet's made of metal. I think if I shoot him once, I'm set. Let's keep the other 34 bullets in my gun so that I can use them in another situation because I'm pretty sure one bullet's going to stop him and give me the advantage in, this, in, in what we're trying to do here. Or two bullets or three bullets instead of going a 30 or 40 or whatever the fuck you see on the news nowadays. And... I think it just comes down to a lack of thinking. And I always try to look for the way the, the real world practically works. And I also, admittedly, a lot of the times I relate problems other people have to the problems I have. So the problem that I've had for a long time with my own business is I, you know, again, you can criticize and saying I'm relating my business too much to the world here, but it, it makes it easy for me to talk to my subscriber base that understands my problems. It makes it easier to talk to the 33,000 people who've been watching this for the last five years who understand how I think, uh, you know. One of the issues that I talk about with motherboard repair and the reason that you don't find a lot of people doing the things that I do in my business is because the people who know how to troubleshoot and diag you know, diagnose these electronic problems the same way I do, they don't want to work on products that are worth 200 to 700 bucks. They don't. They want to do higher level stuff. So they go to college, they get an advanced degree, they get real world training, and then they work for Lockheed Martin. They work for Texas Instruments. They work for Intersil. They work for a national semiconductor <clears throat> making $150,000 to $500,000 a year. 
They don't want to work on little consumer devices for a hundred to seven hundred dollars that people just use to jerk off and you know and use Facebook. It doesn't make sense. So this. Uh, the issue that I have is that it's difficult to find good people because the salaries that our business can support will not pay the people who are actually skilled to do this job. And that, that, that's a very, very common problem. Uh, you know, again, I remember hiring somebody. And again, uh, there are going to be a lot of trolls about the, you know, the fact that you suck as a manager. Your business is run terribly. And again, one of the things I'll often say to those people is, well, what has your business done? Oh, I don't have a business or do anything. Ah, but anyway, back on track. I've hired a lot of idiots, and there's the saying that a uh, saying that you know you shouldn't attribute to malice what can be contributed to stupidity. I, I know I'm misquoting it, but it's something like that. You shouldn't attribute to malice what you can attribute to stupidity. And again, I've hired people that did not know how to spell Fernando. I've hired people that couldn't give somebody back their laptop that was in slot E6 when the note said it was an E6, and the slots were arranged alphabetically by number. They couldn't find E6. I've hired people that when they said, okay, can you put my data on this for me after we recover their data? And they said yes, when this, that device, was a DVD player from 1997. Again, I'm, I'm used to stupid. I know what stupid smells like. I know what stupid looks like. I know what stupid. Yeah, I know how stupid walks. I know what stupid eats for dinner. I know what what TV shows stupid watches when stupid goes home. I'm familiar with stupid, and a lot of this stuff just seems like the stupid shit that people would do when they're just they're stupid. I'm not going to say that race doesn't play a role in it because keep in mind that racism stops people from thinking, and racism is going to stop people from thinking. Like if I see somebody that's black, let me not think about the fact that I'm choking them too hard. Let me not think about the fact that that's probably a cell phone or a water pistol or a Game Boy and not a fucking gun. Um, you know, then it stops people from thinking. But I really think that the issue is that a lot of the people who are getting in this hot water to begin with are not exactly people that are known for their thinking even when there's no racism involved. So I would say it's kind of like a 70, th again, the split is a subjective. I'd say it's 70% stupid, 30% racism. Racism totally contributes to it because racism stops people from thinking, but I feel like a lot of the people that are getting in hot water in these situations on the, on the law enforcement side were not exactly the brightest bulbs to begin with. And I really believe that this all comes down to thinking. Racism... <coughs> Racism stops people from thinking. That is the worst. That is the, the worst thing that it does. That is the absolutely at the core of the issue. Is that racism just? I mean, you're not going to think. And the reason that I don't really criticize is because I identify with the problem of not being able to hire somebody um, to the qualification you need based on the salary that that you will support. So if I want a trained mercenary who knows exactly when the person who is three times their size is faking versus knowing when they're really in pain and will die, so please loosen your grip, that person, the person who when it's dark at night you can barely see can differentiate the cell phone from the, you know, the, the light bouncing off the cell phone from the light bouncing off the gun, the people who can notice that shit, the people who don't get scared and go, oh my God, in a scary situation and empty their gun 35 times just because they're scared, the people who maintain their composure, those people may cost more than $35,000. <laughs> and the thing is, again, just the same way that the people who know how to fix motherboards are... That you know, they don't want my fucking fifty to sixty thousand dollars a year. They want a, you know, they 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 want a mansion. They want a nice car. They want the things that really good design engineers get. And I, I don't know how to provide it. And in terms of this, again, can you find people for thirty-five thousand to forty thousand a year that will think? Absolutely. And even in the smaller towns where law enforcement starts, maybe in the twenties or the low thirties, can you find people who will think for that amount of money? Absolutely. Is it hard? Again, subjective. Based on my experience, totally subjective, yes, it is harder. The more you lower the salary, the harder it is to find people who think. And when you contribute the fact that racism keeps people from thinking, it just makes that shit so much harder. <coughs> And I'm not going to try to say that. Uh, I don't want to jump in and say that I know the solution to the problem because honestly, I don't. I, I have experienced very, very limited racism in, in my time on earth. And I am not, a, I have never worked in law enforcement. And I try to not be one of those people that says, yeah, we need this or we need that or you need to do this when I've never done your job. I shy away from being that person. I'm going to say, 
you should do it this way because it works better. Watch me show you that it works better when I do it myself. That's the type of person I am. And I can't do that with this issue. So I'm not going to try to say, yeah, you need more education. Yeah, you need more sensitivity training. Yeah, you need more people who are this race on your foot. No, I'm not going to say any of that because I honestly, I can't know if that works. What I, what I will say is the one thing that I feel that could be improved all around is just more thinking when it comes to race. There's this one saying that Thomas Watson from IBM had. He said, thought, he says, has been the father of every advance since time began. I don't think has cost the world millions of dollars. And I, re I really believe in that. Uh, you know, think. Thought, in this case, it, it doesn't just cost the world millions of dollars. It's starting to cost the world lives. And it's something that really should be revisited. It is the main, you know, again, the main message of my channel. I, when you went to practical board repair school, you saw people wearing T-shirts that said, use your brain. And I really think that, that should just be applied in every aspect of life not just advanced diagnostics on, comp on motherboards for laptop computers. All right, so one more story here before I'm done, I promise. Last story. So my grandpa was one of these people that was alive for the height of the crack era in New York City. So like the 80s in the South Bronx and parts of Brooklyn and Midtown Manhattan, they were really, really nasty. You had, uh, you know, kids getting kicked out of their homes by their crackhead parents. You had, you know, the parents getting evicted. You had gangs shooting at one another. You had all this crap going on in the streets. You had, it was just a really, a really fucked up place if you were alive for that time. I wasn't alive for most of it. I got to see, like, some of Manhattan and some of Brooklyn during, like, the tail end of it ending, but I didn't, I wasn't really around for that, that era. It was really fucked up. And my grandpa, he had a couple of hobbies, and one of his hobbies included just, just general carpentry and, you know, fixing up old homes and stuff like that. Now, my grandpa didn't have a lot of time, but that was one of the things that he would do to just get his mind off things. He had a lot of work to do. When he wasn't at work, he was busy caretaking for my mentally ill grandmother, and that took a lot. They didn't have the psychologists and the medicine and the types of therapy in 1960s and 70s that they have today. They don't have the medicine and all that that they have today. So it was really... It was really, really difficult thing for him to go through. And he would, he would be on again, off again with work. And it was just a, a whole big mess. So when he wouldn't have to care for my grandma and when he wasn't at work, he would spend a few hours every now and then during the week fixing up some of the old, abandoned, you know, screwed up houses that were in his neighborhood. And every now and then he'd be working and there'd be some kids that saw what he was doing. And he'd say, hey, come over here and help me out. And the kid would go, why? And he goes... Don't you want to have a place to, for yourself? And, you know, 13, 15 year old kids that are most likely cutting school, yeah, they, they probably do want a place to play dice and play cards and drink beer, or do whatever the hell teenagers that are delinquent want to do. You know, they, and so they, they would, and they would come inside. And they would help him out. So he would he would be building the house, not building the house, you know, I mean, like fixing the walls, fixing up the doors, fixing up the floors and all that shit. And he would give some of these kids some simple things to do. And sometimes he would do most of the work and then he'd say, here, enjoy. Now, you may see this as child labor. You may see this as illegal, as liability, as contributing to delinquency. But what you don't see, if you're one of those critics, is that these were kids that were most likely in gangs, some of them definitely in gangs, that were doing things on the street that they really shouldn't have been doing, that were not doing that in the street because they were now helping my grandpa, uh, you know, fix up old houses in the neighborhood. And we can get into the entire argument of what the ideal thing is to do in this situation. Personally speaking, you know, if you're going to be a delinquent kid, it's probably best that you sit in a house with, with an adult who's, who's doing carpentry while drinking a beer than, um, than, than to be outside and shooting at, at people and selling drugs. Um, so he, he, he did that. And that was, that was one of the things that he got a kick out of. He liked involving kids in some of the stuff he was doing. And he liked, you know, he liked to uh, helping be a part of rebuilding his neighborhood. And it, again, it, it was a shithole. This is one of those neighborhoods where if you walk down the wrong street at the wrong time, it, you, you're getting the shit kicked out of you. You're getting robbed. It's just, just, just give up. He, you know, the reason I have that humbler stick here that you see in the other videos is because he used to carry that thing all, all around, around with him all the time because you were just constantly getting robbed. I really should get up and show you what I mean. For those of you who are not regulars of the, so at the height of the crack era, <laughs> my grandpa made this. Uh, he was, um, he worked at a, at a, at a brewery, uh, you know, working on the machines that were used to make the bottles, and he made this. This is, this is what we, what we call at the shop the humbler. We use it for. Uh, banging out corners in the phones. Uh, but he, he carried this because at any given time, you were subject to getting robbed 
and getting the shit kicked out of you by somebody with a knife or a gun or two or three people just run up on you and just do whatever they could to somebody who looked like they, they may have had money on them. And, uh, you know, he, he sees that there's about 14 or 16 people. He's like, uh, you know, I'm not Superman. I'm not Jackie Chan. I give up. And, he, and he just, he's standing there ready to get the living shit kicked out of him. And he sees that there's, that there's one black kid in the group that he knew. And he made eye contact with the kid. It was one of the kids that was helping him while he was working on the house. And the kid goes, hey, wait, 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 wait. That's Mr. Jack. He's cool. And everybody goes, oh. And then the kid tells the other kids who he is and the other teenagers and all the other people that were about to beat the shit out of him. And they go, oh, hey, what's up? And they go up to him and they shake his hand. Now, I'm not saying that, 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 that that's really necessarily the best thing in the world. It's not the best thing in the world that the gang exists. It's not the best thing in the world that a gang exists that fully intended to kick the crap out of him and rob him. But my point here is, look at, just by avoiding all the stereotypes of race, just by my grandpa saying, hey, person that I don't know that doesn't look like me, would you like to be a part of making this a better place? Would you like to come, you know, just help me out with this? And just by putting that positive energy out there into the world, he avoided getting his ass kicked and getting robbed. And, you know, and it's just one of those things where, you know, like, I would like to see more of that in the world today. I'd like to see more of, let's help somebody out that I don't know, that doesn't look like me, just for the hell of it. Just for the hell of putting some positive energy out there, even though that person has not done anything yet to prove that they're necessarily worth that positive energy. Like, let's just see what happens if, I, if I'm not going to, if I'm not going to judge, if I'm, if I'm not going to, you know, interview somebody before I do something nice. Let's just see if I just put some positive energy and say, hey, come help me out with this, or hey, how are you? And like, like, like the, the 70, my 70-year-old grandpa does to some 15-year-old kid. Like, look at how that repaid him. Again, for all you know, there, there was a gang initiation there, and that one person's job was to stomp the crap out of my grandpa in front of 16 people, rob him, hey, you know, leave him there half dead, like what very, very often happened in certain parts of the Bronx and Brooklyn. And, and all of that was just gone. All of that was erased in a second because of that, 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 because of that goodwill that he showed before there was any real motivation to show that goodwill. And that's, that's a cool thing. I want to see more of that. I want to see more of, of people just working together and forgetting what people look like and just using their brain and thinking, if I may, if, just, and just thinking it, like that, 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 that would be really cool. And, you know, th that's part of what makes this YouTube channel here fun. What I enjoy about this is, you know, again, it's the same thing. That I feel like it's the same thing that my grandpa enjoyed. Like, at the end of the day, he got to make the world a little bit better in some small way. Nothing crazy, just in some small way he got to make the world better and make somebody else feel better and have a better place. Some of those kids wound up staying in those houses and because some of those kids didn't have a place to live. They were living on the streets. And, again, I'm not, not going to say it's the ideal situation. I'm not going to say it's the best thing in the world that a 15-year-old kid is living in some abandoned house. But... It beats living on the street, and it beats depending on a gang to find you a play, you know, a roof over your head when it's raining or snowing, and it was just a really, a really fucked up time. But he did these small things to try to make the world uh, a better place. And that one day where he didn't, you know, have this thing stolen from him and get the shit kicked out of him with it, uh, and 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 that's part of what makes this channel fun. I I like at the end of my day, once I'm done with work and personal stuff and all the other crap, to be able to sit down here for a half hour and show other people how to do something that may, in some very small way, benefit their life. Like, I, I feel like I share that that trait with my grandpa, and and it and it's pretty cool. And that, that, you know, it's fun and, and, and I enjoy it. And, I, and I, th I would like to see more of that in the world. I'd like to see more of uh, me, other people ignoring what you look like, what your culture is, what your background is. And just for the hell of it, just, in, just having a more inviting nature of saying, you're a different age group than me. You're a different race than me. You're a different skin color than me. You're a different religion than me. Would you like to work together with me on this just for the fuck of it? And, and, and somebody else saying yes. Like, I, I really wish that I could have been alive for those days in the 60s and 70s where I could just watch and see how, how we interface with these people and how my, my, my grandpa just became this guy that everybody knew in the neighborhood to the point where he could be walking down the street with his work bag and all of his tools and all of his stuff and these, ga and these gang members would walk, walk by and say, we're not robbing him because Mr. Jack is cool. Like, that's, that, that, I wish I could have been around for that. And I know I've kind of veered off topic. I don't, I don't, and that's probably not the, you know, the most related thing to what I'm talking about. But it's something that I just think about when I think of racism in particular. You were able to bridge this gap and just, and just get rid of so much crap over just, just saying hi. 
Would you like to work with me on this? Hi, would you like to be, you know, would you like to learn how to use a hammer or how to put a floorboard in and shit like that? It's just, and it's just this random shit. And it, and, and there's so much positivity and so much good comes out of it. And, you know, uh, my, my grandpa, admit, I'm going to be on 100% honest with you, you know, the way the story, my, my family tells the story, he started out in the, you know, the early 1900s with the, the kind of general racism that, 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 that was indoctrinated into him by his family. And, Again, and by the time like the mid 1900s came around and he got older, he kind of realized that it was just a bunch of bullshit, and he died a person that believed that all people were created equally. And you know, it, it's a it's a really cool thing because again, like my that was on my dad's side of the family, and on my mom's side of the family, again, the story with my grandma and all of that 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 was passed on and passed on and passed on, and I'm really happy to say that you know that stops with me. I don't I don't see things in those terms. I don't I'm not gonna cross the street because somebody looks different than me. I'm not gonna be googly eyed because some somebody looks different than me. I'm not going to make the jump to 50 assumptions about uh, somebody that I don't know because they look different than me. And you know, it's it's you can choose to end it with your generation or you can choose to keep passing on the shit that your parents and your grandparents and your great grandparents taught you. And if we want the next generation to be filled with those type of people that do not care what people look like, like it starts with us. <laughs>